Hello, welcome to Congressional Update with Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. So nice to virtually meet you, Congresswoman. You as well, you as well, sir. Good to be with you at this virtual uh, studio. Yes. And I look forward to doing it in person. Yes, well, thank you very much for doing this for the city of Somerville. It's always really cool to have someone who isn't a city official come and give you the different perspective. So thank you. So there is of course a lot to talk about. Um, I, I guess I just wanna first ask because uh, you were asking ahead, you almost implied, how, how are you doing with COVID and your family? How, how are you coping with it? And is everyone okay? And just- Oh, curious. yeah, that's so kind of you to ask. I mean, I, uh, our family has certainly been, uh, you know, personally impacted, like everyone's, you know, family in some way. Um, but we're all safe and healthy uh, right now. And, you know, I send my condolences to anyone who has suffered a personal loss uh, during this mm -hmm. pandemic. But, you know, even if you have not, um, have been fortunate enough to not suffer a personal loss uh, in your family or your immediate community, I think, you know, we're all experiencing um, a collective grief and hurt um, given the unprecedented events that have occurred in the last year. And I won't even limit that to the pandemic. I mean, it's been an, un and 2020 was unprecedented for many reasons. Yes, yes. Well, uh, focusing on the pandemic for the, this moment, um, it is something that affects everybody. And there's recently, you you guys recently passed the American Rescue Plan to address COVID-19 economic impact. Can you just give a little summary of what, what it does or what you think, what components of it you think are most important? Absolutely. Well, first I just want to acknowledge that um, I think the federal response under the prior administration I really failed to pass a relief package that would meet the scale and scope of the crisis. So the American Rescue Plan is a bold step in the right direction um, to truly meet the scale and scope of the crisis. A nearly $2 trillion bill um, that uh, allocates um, $79 million uh, specifically uh, for Somerville and $8.9 million for uh, Somerville public schools. Um, additionally, the uh, individual and direct relief um, mm -hmm. to, again, individuals and families, um, what many characterize as stimulus checks, I call survival checks, because at this point, mm -hmm. uh, that's what they are. It's not about stimulating the economy. It's about people purchasing food, medication, diapers, um, paying rent to remain safely housed. So there's a stimulus check in the amount of $1,400. Um, I was one of the people who fought for the expansion of eligibility for those stimulus checks. So the eligibility now includes uh, mixed immigration status families. Uh, in prior packages, we had not done anything uh, for our immigrant neighbors. It also expands eligibility for adult dependents. And then, um, you know, given the unprecedented unemployment, uh, we've mm -hmm. extended unemployment uh, through to September 6th and added a $300 supplemental on top of, of each of those. There's also a child tax credit, which many have characterized as um, the biggest sort of anti-poverty piece of legislation in modern times, which will cut child poverty uh, in half. Um, and of course, massive uh, infusions of federal investment to ensure that we continue to have an equitable public health response with the pandemic, um, but also an, an equitable economic recovery. And so um, this will now be the third iteration of the payroll protection program and the economic injury disaster loans to support our small businesses. Um, and then I'll just round out the top lines of this in mm -hmm. saying that um, I, I, I led uh, in the fight for our Congress, for our community health centers. Um, mm -hmm. The Massachusetts Seventh boasts the largest uh, concentration of community health centers, certainly in the Commonwealth, maybe in the country, there are 15 of them. Uh, one in three of my constituents receive their care from a community health center. Um, and even if you don't have one in your town or municipality, um, they have been critical partners, again, in our public health response and certainly uh, have been uh, very critical in our vaccine distribution. And we secured $7.6 billion for our community health centers. 
So wow. again, child tax credit, expanded unemployment, expanded eligibility for stimulus payments. Um, massive. Yeah. That's a so, massive thing that we're facing. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So was there anything missing from it that you felt should have been included or could be added? Yes, and, and while I get to that, I'll also just um, cite that given the unprecedented impact of this global pandemic and the unprecedented destabilization of families and, um, and, and their households with, um, you know, the, the federal response under the previous administration was not keeping pace, you know, with the hurt, but the bills didn't stop coming. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I, I continue to fight for the canceling of, of rent and mortgages. We did make massive investments in rental assistance programs to support tenants remaining self, safely housed and also supporting small landlords. That is in the American Rescue Plan. Um, but I believe that we should be providing direct relief in the form of survival checks at $2,000 for the duration of the crisis. We should be canceling a uh, rent and mortgage. Um, or at least there should be an eviction and foreclosure moratorium. Uh, we do uh, continue to see uh, our, our neighbors who are unhoused and experiencing homelessness struggling, and many that are on the precipice um, of, of homelessness. Again, because we do not have those eviction and foreclosure moratoriums, and we have not canceled rent and mortgage. And the fact that people could be facing, um, you know, living in those conditions in the midst of a global pandemic is just unconscionable. Um, and that's why I'm very proud that my bill, the Emergency Homeless Assistance Act, uh, which is $5 billion, was included in the American Rescue Plan, which gives municipalities the flexibility to meet the needs of our most vulnerable, including doing things like purchasing um, a motel and converting it into um, you know, temporary or perhaps even permanent housing. Um, the other things that I would like to see on top of those $2,000 reoccurring survival checks, canceling rent and mortgage, eviction and foreclosure moratoriums is the canceling of student debt. Mm -hmm. um, in Massachusetts alone, we have 855,000 federal borrowers. Um, many are paying monthly bills, the equivalent of a mortgage payment. Um, and we have got to just eliminate a bill as people seek to recover. I think that should be a part um, of the recovery. And uh, that's something that President Biden can do by executive action, just with a stroke of a pen, and, and really begin to mitigate that hurt. And finally, a $15 minimum wage. We know that um, that would increase the uh, salaries or the wages of some 32 million workers, and it would take about a million people out of poverty. So the American Rescue Plan, you know, certainly help is on the way. Again, it makes bold investments and strides in the right direction to meet the scale and scope of this crisis. But in order for us to truly rescue America, our work is not done. Although the pandemic has um, disproportionately hit uh, communities of color um, and other marginalized communities the hardest, no one has been exempt from the hurt of this pandemic and no one should be left behind. Yeah, that's well said. So I wanna go back for a moment to the federal student uh, loan and debt relief, because this is something you and several of your colleagues have pushed for for a while. And I believe Senator Warren said that, you know, not addressing this was not addressing uh, an injustice of, of racial and generational, you know, wealth gap. So can you explain to me, because there was a proposal at one point, wasn't it, for $10,000 per person that Biden was proposing. And then, and then a group of, of Congresswomen had suggested 50,000 and the president said he didn't have the authority to approve that. So I, could you just straighten that out for me? Sure. Um, well, I've been uh, championing the need to cancel student debt since I arrived at Congress. Yes. Um, and, you know, again, I think that for a long time, there was a narrative that only um, white graduate students who attended Ivy League institutions have student debt. And that really does a disservice to just how um, deep and wide this $2 trillion crisis is. 
We're talking about you know, students who have been victimized by uh, the deceptive business practices and predatory marketing of for-profit colleges oh, and universities. The for-profit colleges, yeah. Exactly. We're, t- we're talking about um, you know, seniors. I have people in my district who are 76 years old who are still- I, know, paying- I couldn't believe that when I read that on your website. It's true. Like, oh. it's true. Who are yeah. still paying student debt um, and uh, who's still paying on those loans. Uh, we have educators who lost their licensure to teach because they defaulted on loans, loans that they earned in order to be uh, educators. So this is not just a millennial or Gen Z issue. Um, mm-hmm. This is, um, again, the prior narrative um, that I've already uh, you know, referenced uh, does a disservice. Um, this is a $2 trillion crisis, and we know that it is disproportionately bore um, on the backs of of black and brown student borrowers. Um, Specifically black students, 85% uh, have no choice but to take out student loans because of discriminatory practices like redlining, which have obstructed families' abilities, black Americans' families, to to build generational wealth. And then then they're- And isn't there then a higher default rate as well? Yes, five times. Yeah, yeah. Five times, so black student borrowers are you know, 85% of black students feel they have no choice but to take out loans. And then they are five times more likely to default uh, than their white counterparts. So, um, you know, what, what we're advocating for is that President Biden cancel student debt. He has the authority. And in fact, I know at the town hall, he initially said he did not. But, you know, we really appreciate that the very next day um, in the by his press secretary, they did uh they did correct the record um, okay. because President Biden was given the authority by executive action uh, through the Higher Education Act by Congress. Um, and so um, he had said that he was willing to cancel 10,000. But when I'm in the room with social workers, educators, healthcare workers, you know, seniors, anyone burdened with this debt, they've said that's just princi- that's 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 basically just interest. It's yeah. not even getting at the principal. And so um, the last update that we had from the White House is that uh, the president had asked um, for legal counsel and for them to work up a memo for him about what might be legally within his authority to do. Um, so what do you think? And, and, and what amount, and what amount. But the, whether or not he has the authority to cancel student debt is not up for debate because he was given that authority by Congress through the Higher Education Act to do that by executive action. And I think, you know, this is also about our recovery. You know, you you cancel, this is about, it jumpstarts our economy. Mm -hmm. You're mitigating the hurt, you know, for individuals and families who have been burdened by this debt. And so it's just a matter of of economic justice, of racial justice, of, of generational justice. I, I have a niece who's a social worker and she just, it's a major deal and it's, it'll be with her for a while. So yeah, I'm not kidding you, Sarah. I don't, it doesn't matter what room I'm in in, yeah, person, I know. in no. person or by a Zoom, it is yeah. the first issue that people raise with me. Yeah, what are we going to do about this debt? Thank you for fighting it. Are we going to get it done? Wow. So what do you think will happen next? Well, you know, I'm encouraged because I think it's important to recognize that the Biden-Harris administration has been given a bold and decisive mandate by a broad and diverse coalition of of mostly issues-based activists and the most marginalized communities who made their election possible. You know, this was a coalition of, of black and brown and indigenous and AAPI and disabled and young and, and you know, LGBT uh, Q folks is a big coalition. And it, they gave them a decisive mandate with that decisive victory to champion and to advance bold progressive policies. And one of those issues that many of those issues based activists um, endorse and are pushing for is the canceling of student debt. So this is about being responsive to the needs of the coalition that elected you. And again, it also works within the context of immediate and broader strategies to both recover from the pandemic to more than just a pre-COVID unjust normal, but to chart a more equitable path forward. Um, And also to to actualize racial justice. So do you, I guess my question is, do you think this will happen anytime soon or 
will will any significant level of relief be written off by the president in any time in the near future? I'm encouraged by where we are. And okay. that's really a testament, um, not only okay. to the partnership of Majority Leader Schumer, Senator Warren, Representative Omar, and others who have been um, leading this fight with me in Congress, but it's really a testament again to the coalition who elected Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. So we're okay. just gonna keep organizing. We're gonna keep applying pressure. But again, as recently as last week, he said that he was, um, uh, asking for his legal team to put together a memo to let him know what was um, allowable. So I okay, do believe we will be seeing student debt canceled in the form of an executive action. I think the issue at this point is in what amount. Okay. So that memo should be worked up, you know, within the next couple of months. Okay. That's, that's the kind of prediction that is hard to make, but I was hoping you would make. So mm -hmm. thank you. So there are all these big ticket items now that are out there. Now you did you did this rescue plan, but now there's the infrastructure package. What is the likelihood of of large pieces of legislation passing, given the slim to none majority that exists in Congress, one way or the other? So, it, is it going to have to be cut down? I today was the first that I read that maybe. Biden was saying some things could be limited, but I, do you have any thoughts on how the, the legislation will transform or not, whether it'll pass? Well, you know, I, I would just, uh, you know, say that ultimately the, the filibuster has been a, an obstacle to not only us in, more recently passing comprehensive relief packages to meet the scale and scope of the crisis, but it has been um, an obstacle to our restoring voting rights, to yes. lowering the cost of prescription drugs, to passing an anti-lynching bill. So ultimately the filibuster must be abolished. In the meantime, I think we have to exact and leverage every tool available to us to ensure that we are passing, you know, bold bills that make the bold investments that are not only necessary, but possible. Um, I'm sorry, but popular. You know, they're they're necessary and they are and they are popular. Um, I you know, I'm grateful that the definition of infrastructure has been expanded because yes. it should certainly include much more than our highways and our roads and our bridges. I serve on the Financial Services Committee. Housing is under that. And members of the Financial Services Committee, you know, under the leadership of our chairwoman, Maxine Waters, have been fighting, you know, that fight for a long time that uh, the definition of infrastructure be expanded to include housing. Um, and I will say as the co-founder of the Future of Transportation Caucus, I continue to uh, advocate for us to uh, prioritize in our federal funding and our investments um, to go beyond highways, roads, and bridges, but to make those multimodal infrastructure the future of transportation caucus. I'm also a co-chair of the congressional bike caucus. And again, as I said, I serve on the financial services committee, which has housing. Um, do you, you ride know, your bike? Jurisdiction. Yes, I do. Excellent. Yes, I do. Wow. Um, I don't commute. Um, I'm not doing that as of yet. Um, well, from, from here to DC. <laughs> well, I mean, this to work every day in Washington, yeah, but maybe I can eventually uh, build up to that. But but the point is, I you know I think um, within our federal funding and investments when it comes to infrastructure, I want to see us prioritize equity, accessibility, sustainability, connectivity well, to jobs and education. You see, Look jobs and jobs is now being mentioned first, I believe, at least that I've noticed, it makes it sound like this, or at least part of it is like a new deal program. It's like a works progress or a progress public works, you know, effort. So it, it, it is a broader definition, it seems. It All is. Right. And, you know, uh, you know, Democrats and, you know, our progressive caucus, you know, more specifically, are really fought to expand that definition of infrastructure. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged to see that we've made those strides and we just have to keep, keep working. Right. 
So I want to talk about uh, criminal justice reform on your website. I don't know if I can properly uh, illustrate this, but it says criminal, and then there's a parenthesis and an I, and then there's an N, and then there's another parenthesis and the word justice. So it's criminal in justice. So this is something that you have been working on for a long time, and you have a lot of thoughts, and you have a, a people's justice guarantee, which is 30 pages. My PDF went, you know, <laughs> how am I going to do this one? So, Sorry I, about that. <laughs> you know, so, and I, and I want to distinguish judicial system reform specifically from police department operations, which is another important level of reform. But within the justice system, what what is critically important to you to be changed? to make things more equitable. Well, I, yeah, well, so, well, I know there are a lot, but some yeah, of the most sure. critical. Yeah, yeah, there are so many things there. So the People's Justice Guarantee, I really consider it to be, you know, sort of in the same way that people, now the Green New Deal has become this sort of litmus mm -hmm. test and this North Star, um, and then has created a framework whereby multiple bills have been uh, introduced to support mm -hmm. that broader frame, which is a new one and, and a more a radical and bold one. That's the same thing that we are doing with the People's Justice Guarantee. So what this is offering is just a true justice, healing and accountability. And it, would re and it really gets us ultimately to mass decarceration mm -hmm. after decades of mass incarceration. So this is gonna reduce our prison population. I think it's about creating a just political system um, that we have not done previously because of a deficit of political will, plain and simple. And it's really time that we demonate, demonstrate the courage necessary to make it a reality. So this is just a new framework, a new vision, again, of justice, healing and accountability. And I've introduced but, many bills under that, like abolishing uh, the federal death penalty, ending yeah. qualified immunity, um, the end push out act to stop the criminalization of black and brown uh, children disproportionately in our schools, contributing to the school to confinement like path. dress codes or other. Exactly, exactly. Disciplinary measures, yeah. Exactly. And I should also add, you know, there are also uh, elements of this that I'm looking to address that uh, speak to the ways in which our unjust immigration system um, is tied to our unjust criminal uh, legal system. So, you know, it, we have to actively seek to dismantle this carceral state and to put an end to mass incarceration. People think that social problems go to jail, but human beings go. Mm. That's such a well-turned phrase. Okay, so well, I have to say that it's um it's inspired by the words of Angela Davis. It's not I'm not quoting her exactly, but it's inspired by Angela Davis. Okay, well, I as a reporter, I appreciate that. <laughs> So, uh, so we don't have tons of time left, but I want to make sure we get to police reform a little bit. So in Somerville here, where our longtime mayor is, is not going to run for re-election. I don't know if you ha have any thoughts on that, but in Somerville, there have already been several um, initiatives to affect police reform. Last year, I believe we had an 8% uh, budget reduction for the police department and that money went elsewhere, other departments. And there's now an effort to establish a civilian oversight board. And two people were hired, one of whom is an outreach worker and has started to have meetings and that kind of thing. There's also a survey you can take online. I took it. Even if you've moved from Somerville, you can take it. Um, so I just wondered, it may, maybe you could give us a sense of how that level of activity compares to other communities in your district. I mean, I know Cambridge and Boston have some oversight efforts. Uh, what have you seen that you thought looked very promising? Well, I, I think establishing a civilian review board is certainly a, a step in the right direction. You know, mm -hmm. clearly I have um, you know, broader, more radical thoughts about how we get to true systemic change, which is why I introduced the People's Justice Guarantee. Um, but I do think that what is important with this Civilian Review Board is that there are not conflicts of interest, um, that you have people that are deeply uh, committed to doing this work, um, that are accountable uh, to the people, 
um, who are also being paid a living wage. Um, and that the Civilian Review Board is not one that is a review board in name only. You know, ultimately, this is about oversight and accountability. And so um, there should be real teeth to it. Mm -hmm. And I will say about the outgoing mayor, uh, Mayor Joe Cardatoni, I've, I've known him and worked closely with him. Uh, in fact, since um, I worked for Congressman Joseph P. Kennedy II, you know, so um, a very long time. And we've been, um, you know, great partners. Um, certainly working very closely during this pandemic, but prior to that on liquor license reform and other social and racial mm -hmm. justice issues um, like banning facial recognition technology um, yes, and housing something. development. So, you know, we, we work together, um, you know, closely on many of, of those issues, um, grateful for his service and, you know, looking forward to see what this next chapter will bring for him. Okay, we have very little time left, but I have to ask you, uh, Boston now has an acting mayor who is a woman of color. When you first came to the Boston City Council, you were the first woman of color. And when you came in 2010 and then 2018, when you were first elected as, as US rep, you were the first woman of color in the Massachusetts congressional delegation. First person of color, period. So on the city council, yeah, I was the first black woman. Yeah. Um, and it took 100 years for that. And in our congressional delegation, it took 230 years uh, to elect the first person of color, period. So I guess my question is, from 2010 to 2018, yeah. one could say there was this big sea change. Now, maybe it wasn't, maybe it was you know, happening, but do you have a sense of how momentous it is? Do you feel like it's too little to too late, what, what is your impression over that eight year period that that much happened? Yeah, I mean, it's a testament to the electorate. Um, it's an, a testament to um, extraordinary and compelling uh, public servants who have stepped forward. I'm so inspired by uh, mm -hmm. the diversity and the historic nature of candidates that we see um, really in the Commonwealth at every level of government especially on the municipal level. At the end of the day, government is stronger and more effective and it reflects the citizenry that it represents and it serves. And, you know, Sarah, that's not so that we can pat ourselves on the back about how progressive we are for, you know, contrived moments of sort of, you know, kumbaya. Um, the power of that diversity of perspective and opinion and thought around the table is the impact in policy. It means that there's someone around the table that, that calls the question that asks a different question. You know, really quickly, my first budget cycle as a Boston city councilor, every department and agency that came before me, I asked them, what are you doing for the girls? And their answers were monosyllabic. By the second budget cycle, they came with cross-tab multicolored binders because they knew that someone would call the question. <laughs> and, and, that is, and that is the power and the strength of having right. that diversity of lived experience perspective and thought around policy making table. So this is a historic and exciting time, uh, certainly in the Massachusetts seventh, um, but I really do think uh, for our Commonwealth in our country. Well, you are so good. Yes, we have to end right this minute for me not to get in trouble. Thank you so much, <laughs> Congresswoman Ayanna Presley for agreeing to do this show for the city of Somerville. I'm Sarah Fishman. Have a good day, everyone. See you soon. <laughs>